I'm Barbara Bodine, and I am the director of the Institute for the Study of Diplomacy at Georgetown. And I want to very much welcome you to our webinar this afternoon. Um, I was explaining to Eric just a moment ago that there is an element of selfishness in this. It is uh, last March when we all defaulted to online teaching. Most of us were just making it up as we went along and doing the very best we could. Now that we're facing this as at least our new normal for the foreseeable future, um, we're all interested in both how can we do a better job teaching and therefore help our students do a better job learning. And um, it's more than the ad hoc ideas we came up with in the spring. Um, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Kelly McFarland, um, ISD's Director of Programs and Research, who put this program together with Professor Leonard and Alistair, and I'm going to get out my pad and my pen and start taking a lot of notes because my class starts in about three weeks. So thank you for joining us, and Kelly, over to you. Thanks, Barbara, and I'd like to welcome everybody to today's webinar, The New Reality, Teaching International Affairs Online. As Barbara noted, my name is Kelly McFarland, the Director of Programs and Research here at the Institute. This institute brings together diplomats, other practitioners, scholars, and students to explore global challenges and the evolving demands of diplomatic statecraft, to better understand the nexus of theory and practice, and to enhance and expand an appreciation of the role of diplomacy. Our case studies program has developed nearly 250 cases on an exceptionally broad range of topics and events. These case studies support faculty and students who seek to bring real world examples of diplomacy in action into the classroom. We're all gearing up for a rapidly approaching semester, more rapidly than I think any of us want, of teaching under the new normal. Hybrid and Zoom classes were unknown to many of us just a few months ago, but now they are the everyday reality for students and faculty the world over. We all need some tips, so we're very excited to have Eric Leonard with us today. Eric is Professor of Political Science and holds the Henkel Family Chair in International Affairs at Shenandoah University. Eric's main areas of research and interest are global politics and global governance, human rights, humanitarian law, and political philosophy. He has published se several articles, case studies, and two books. His first book, as well as one of his case studies for the ISD Case Studies Library, dealt with the emergence of the International Criminal Court. His second book was an international politics textbook, and he also publishes and works extensively on the scholarship of teaching. It is this area that we will focus on today. I'd also like to point out that we're grateful for the generous support of the Carnegie Corporation of New York's Bridging the Gap grant, which funds ISD's case studies library. Thank you also to our case studies editor, Alistair Somerville, and our research assistant, Jonas Hearing, as well as Jessica Lyon from the School of Foreign Service Communications team for putting the webinar together. Be sure to follow ISD on Twitter, at GU Diplomacy, and use the hashtag new reality when tweeting about today's event, and follow the link in the chat to set up an account with our faculty lounge. Now, a quick overview on how things will proceed. Uh, as soon as I stop talking, uh, the main event, Eric will present for about 20 minutes on the fundamentals of teaching online. Then we'll lead a short discussion with them in questions, uh, and then talk a little bit more about case studies specifically, and then we're going to open it up for questions. Please use the Q&A function to pose your questions. And now, Eric, over to you. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, hope everybody's doing well this afternoon. Um, if you're anything like me, you're starting to panic because you see the fall semester rapidly approaching. Um, so as Kelly said, uh, we're going to break this up into a couple of different sections with some Q&As in between. You are all welcome to use the Q&A uh, at the bottom of the screen, though, almost like a chat. Uh, we'll be monitoring that. If something comes up while I'm talking, I'm happy to take it uh, in that moment. If not, we can, we can come back to it at one point or another. Uh, this doesn't necessarily have to run as 20 minutes of me sort of giving a TED Talk, per se, and then Q&A, and then case studies, and then on. I'm happy to take questions in between and stop and pause. So if there's a moment where I mention something or um, something comes up on one of the slides, maybe I don't explain it enough for you, please um, let me know and, uh, and hopefully I see it uh, and, and I'll have an opportunity to answer in the moment. All right, um, so Kelly, give me a, a, a great intro. Um, the only other thing I'd say about this is that um, 
you know, people keep thanking me extensively for doing these things. I've done several of these workshops over the past couple of months. Um, and I will simply say, I love this. This is, this is what I do. Um, pedagogy in general, um, and now more of the hybrid and the online. I've been doing this for about 10 years. I'll talk a little bit more about the online aspect that I've been doing for about 10 years. I've been in the classroom for over 20 years. That really hurt this year when I realized that it had been that long. Uh, but uh, hopefully I can, I can help you guys in getting ready for fall semester today, give you some tips and, and some pointers that I've worked through in some of my failures as I've worked through this, maybe make the road a little easier for all of you uh, as we progress. Okay, I am going to um, share my screen here. Got a little PowerPoint that we'll use today. So we're talking about the new reality that we have here. Um, we're gonna talk both broad strokes and then talk a little bit uh, more in terms of case studies themselves and how you might wanna do case studies and, and implement them in an online forum. I think we tend to shy away from case studies when we talk about online teaching, we shouldn't. I think it's something that can be done. I, I do it myself quite often and, and it works well. There are, 90 or so of you in here. And so I thought to figure out a little bit about what the audience looks like, I would put out two polls early on. Can you see the poll or do I need to close? All right, there we go, we're answering. So my first question, have you taught a full course online before? So just take a second to answer that. Almost there, we're at about 85% of people have voted. Okay, so what we've got here, and I'm gonna end this now, share the results. What we've got here then is 64% no, and yes. Uh, any of you may have had to do it in the spring, maybe you didn't count that necessarily uh, as um, counting as a fully online course since it was more emergency provoked, uh, but that gives me a good sense of what we've got. So here's the other poll, I will launch this now, that I'm very curious to see. So now I would like to know what are the plans for fall? Um, Will you be doing synchronous online, asynchronous online, a hybrid, a high flex? If you don't know what a high flex is, we can talk a little bit about it. Um, it's something that's been out in a lot of the media. And I would imagine there's probably not many of you doing your traditional face-to-face. -face. Right. Got a lot of hybrid, a lot of synchronous online. Give it another 30 seconds or so here. Kind of stuck at 68 out of 89, so that might be it. And so here's what we've got. We've got 51% uh, that are teaching in a hybrid format. I wanna talk a little bit about that term uh, your understanding of hybrid may be different than my understanding of hybrid. Your institution's definition of hybrid may be different than my institution's defini definition of hybrid. About 35% synchronous online, and then 9% asynchronous, 4% high flex, nobody in face-to-face. -face. All right, so that gives us a, a sense of, of where we're at um, in terms of who's here. So. Let me start this in the first three, four minutes here and just clarify some of that vocabulary from my perspective. Now, the first thing I'd like to say is every institution defines these things differently, all right? So I think it's very important that you always go back to your institutional definition. Um, there, there's a lot of 
intellectual debate and discussion about what these different terms mean and everything else. And that's not really where we want to go today, but I at least want to build a common vocabulary for us in this forum over the next hour. So online versus remote. And yes, there is a difference. Okay? I went down this rabbit hole not too long ago uh, where I spent a few days reading all of the literature on the distinctions between online and remote, because for some reason that's how I decided to spend my weekend. Um, and there is a real difference. My guess is that for most of you, you did spring semester in a remote format, meaning you did this almost in a need-based emergency moment. You took what you had from your face-to-face -face class and you put it online and you taught that way. Remote oftentimes is I'm turning on the Zoom camera in a synchronous format, meaning in the time that my class is scheduled, and that's how I'm gonna run this. That's remote. Online is much more intentional. What I would like to talk about today is more of the online teaching. This intentionality that comes with setting up a classroom. You know you're gonna do this online. This doesn't happen because a pandemic shows up and your university shuts down. You can plan ahead. You can set your LMS page for this have everything laid out, all there for your students to understand, to engage, okay? um, and this is really what we wanna talk about today. We wanna to get you to that point where you're doing online and not remote learning. Most of you probably understand asynchronous versus synchronous. This will come up uh, throughout the day today. Your asynchronous on cl online class are those classes that do not have a set time. Your synchronous would be, I have a distinct time. And there are pluses and minuses to both, uh, both in terms of the professor's perspective and the student's perspective. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Okay, so blended and hybrid. This is a big one right now that I'm seeing a lot of confusion about. Pre-pandemic, a hybrid class would be a class in which one day or one class period you would meet online, the next class period you would be in class. My specific institution makes a distinction between a blended and a hybrid class. A blended class is 50% or more is face-to-face. -face. A hybrid class is 50% or more is online without it being fully online. Now we want to distinguish between that and this phrase that most of us hadn't heard until a few months ago, and that is high flex. High flex is, my guess would be a lot of your institutions are doing something like this, where you're going to get the students back on campus and you're going to have some face to face but you can't get everybody in the classroom at the same time for social distancing. So you'll almost break your class up into groups. Group A will be in class on Mondays. Group B will be in class on Wednesdays. Group C will be in class on Fridays. And when those groups are not in class, there will be some online component that they will have to engage, maybe just watching a live stream of the class. Now, the, the way that HyFlex was originally conceived was that this was just about student choice. Before the semester starts, students decide, I want to do this class fully online, I want to do this class face-to-face, um, -face, and the professor sets up both modalities for students. A lot of work, okay, not something that most of us want to take on, but now with social distancing, a lot of institutions like my own are asking us to do some sort of high flex model tailored to the institution that you are, you are in. And then the idea of a video course or a Zoom course, and this is really just remote learning. I, I don't really know how to do this. The best thing that I know how to do is have a synchronous class where I'm gonna turn on Zoom and I'm gonna teach the same way that I did in the classroom. And for many of my colleagues, I know that was the path that they took in spring semester. So we have some sense of, of the modalities that we're talking about here. Okay, so this is what I always like to start with when I do these workshops because most of you are here because you have to be. Um, most people don't embrace online learning. They don't love it. 
Okay? I do. I really enjoy online learning because, as I'll talk about in a second, I think that there are benefits to this that we don't talk enough about. about. There are drawbacks, there are challenges, but there are some real benefits. Does this mean that you should embrace online learning? Not necessarily. Yes, you're gonna have to do it, so do your best at it. But maybe in the end you realize this just doesn't fit my pedagogical style, and that's very important. It's very important for you as an instructor to be self-reflective about what works for you and your style. But don't just dismiss online learning because you don't think it works. And so let's get into this. I'll bring all of these up so that we can work through this a, a, a bit quicker. I think that there are numerous benefits to this, but I found four that really stand out to me personally. Number one, I feel like this made me a better educator. And I put this, this as number one because for me, this was something that I didn't realize was gonna happen when I got into this. And then once I got into it, I couldn't believe how much it improved my teaching. If you're like me and you've been at this for a while, or even if you're just coming out with your PhD and you've got all this tons of knowledge that you wanna to give to your students, it is very, very easy to go and teach a 50 minute class, especially to say an intro level class on whatever the topic of the day is. Let's say you're talking about uh, the role of nations versus states and the idea of sovereignty. I've been doing this for 20 years. I can sort of flip through a few notes in five minutes before I walk into class, walk in and do 50 minutes on that, no problem. Students will love it, it's great, I'm done. Okay. Super easy. When I started to move my classes online, and I should say, I don't have a single class that does not have some online component to it. It's not all purely online. Many are a hybrid model, but everything has an online component to it. And what I realized is when I started to teach online, I had to be much more intentional about everything that I did. I had to create an atmosphere where I, I, what I was going to do and why I was going to do it because of the exercises that I was setting up, because of how I was using my time, all of those other things. It, it, in many ways, like I said, about halfway through my career, I started doing this. It revitalized my career. And yes, I live four and a half hours from my university, and that's part of the reason why I do this. Okay? But as I tell my students all the time, I could live across the street from my campus and I would still do this. Second, and I think, really I can take the second and the third one, uh, and even the fourth one to some degree as a bundle here, I think that this really benefits the students as well. I, uh, maybe I'm an old school professor in this way, I don't agree with a lot of the hand holding that goes on with students. I think we're doing them a disservice. That doesn't mean that you, you don't provide a atmosphere where they can succeed in college, okay? But it doesn't mean that you have to hold their hand all the way through. Online learning puts a level of responsibility on students that they typically don't have. If your students are anything like mine and I'm teaching a face-to-face -face class three days a week, they pretty much think that they just have to come to class three days a week, sit in the class, pay attention, jot some notes, get their C on the exam and, and move on. Online learning is a whole nother level of self-sufficiency. What I tell my students is you have to own the class. You have to take ownership of this. And that creates a student that has time management skills. Okay? That creates a student who's much more self-sufficient. That creates a student who can build skills that will benefit them beyond international politics. They're writing a lot more in an online class. You can set it up where there's a lot more oral communication in an online class if, if you do it well. The critical thinking aspect is elevated. It brings me to that fourth one. I think that it teaches them to learn how to learn. Again, I, 
I've shifted my own perspective on what's important in many of my classes from it has to be content, content, content to I want to create a group of students that know how to learn how to learn, which will make them much more valuable as a member of a democratic society and much more employable, which is what they all want out of this. Right? And I should also say, I only teach undergrads. We do not have a graduate program. For, so for those of you on the grad program, in the grad program, um, yeah, it is different in terms of content versus skill. Drawbacks, got four of those as well. Okay. One, it is impersonal. I, I, I don't disagree. Um, I really enjoy sitting in a classroom with students and engaging them and a limited face-to-face -face does take that away. Two, it's extremely time consuming. Um, my online classes take a lot more time, as I just mentioned, than it would if I were doing a face-to-face -face class. Setting up the modules, uh, recording my Panopto lecture, making sure that everything's reaching my outcomes, those things, it does take me more time. And I think that everyone needs to go in eyes wide open. You wanna do a good online class, it is going to take you more time than your typical face-to-face -face class. There's the academic integrity is issue. Um, if you do a lot of in-class uh, essays, exams, things along those lines, you're gonna need some way to do that if you're in a purely online class and maintain some sense of academic integrity. I do a lot of these for health professions and, and other programs like that that are a bit different than IR and that's their biggest concern that would rise to number one for them in terms of drawbacks. Um, and then there's student resistance. I think that oftentimes students are not open to this, that they're concerned that this isn't gonna be the same. I will say that over the years, as I've done this more and more and, and gotten better at it, that resistance has dissipated. And the minute they take one of my hybrid classes or my online classes, they go, well, that was actually really good. Um, and some even choose that as their, as their main path in terms of their education. Okay, the other thing I wanted to talk about before we, we get into some questions here is how do you create an atmosphere for student success? Um, I think the number one thing that I can say in an online class is you absolutely have to have a clear design to your class. And students have to understand their responsibilities. Now, a lot of the things I'm gonna talk about here, I will say, and again, this goes back to losing some content in your classes at times. I take the entire first week to just map out for students, this is what you need to do in here to succeed. I actually have them write a short little assignment in the first week where they have to list five things that they feel they need to do in my online class if they're going to succeed. And I've actually brought them back to students in the past. I've had students say, oh, I'm struggling in your class because of X, Y, and Z. And I'll pull up their assignment and go, and you know what's funny is number two and three that you wrote in the beginning of the semester that you were gonna do to succeed are exactly what you're not doing. And they all get that sort of deflated, oh, you're right. But it's, it's good for them right up front to see and understand what it is that they need to do. The first, I would say the week before and the first week of class in an online class is everything. If you don't set the right tone, if you don't provide a clear design, that class will be a disaster, plain and simple. And this starts with students understanding what their responsibilities are. What do they need to do in the class? How do they succeed? And like I said, I give them an assignment, literally have them write it out. Right? It's not gonna take you long to read them. You just sort of flip through them real quick. Okay, that looks great. Check, 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 check. Okay, but for them, it's that initial, okay, I know what I need to be doing in here. Another big thing is I'm a huge advocate of backward design. Right? I've worked with grad students and others on setting up their syllabus and I remain confused over the fact that a lot of us don't start with outcomes and work from outcomes into the course material. I've read many a syllabus that don't even have course outcomes on them. All of your online 
course material should build from an outcome, both broad course outcomes and outcomes for modules. I literally set up two to three outcomes that I list for students, extremely transparent, so that they know this week we're talking about globalization and here's the three things that I'm supposed to get out of this. Once I know what those three things that I'm trying to give them for that week are, then I can design the week. Then I can figure out, and this is how I'm going to get them there. Um, clear syllabus and make sure that it's on your learning management system page, okay? Whether it's Canvas, Blackboard, whatever it may be. And I'm a huge advocate of a learner-centered syllabus. Um, we can get into that a little bit more, but the idea here is that you create a syllabus that really engages the students rather than those dry, mundane type of syllabi that we typically put out there because we've had them for forever and they worked and so we just keep dusting them off. I'll be the first to admit, that's what I did for a long time. Um, and I have completely redrafted my syllabi over the past few years to make them more learner focused. Um, intentionality is huge, as I've mentioned, right? You need to be very intentional about what you're doing, when you're doing it, and why you're doing it. If you just Google uh, course design review sheet, you'll get a ton of different sites from teaching and learning institutes around the country, and they provide you a checklist. Did you do this? Did you do this? Did you do this, right? Do you have outcomes? Do your assignments meet those outcomes? And it's a nice little list that you can get. They're very easy to find. The one I like is out of Penn State. Um, I think, uh, Kelly, we could probably provide something to the participants today, a little list of resources that we can send out in the next few days. I can, I can draft that so that you guys have something like that. Build a community and build it early. Again, this goes back to those first two weeks. And I'm, I, and I, you know, I mentioned this and sort of glossed over it. The week before the semester, you need to have everything ready to go and you need to provide it to students. An online class is not something that you can necessarily give them the day that the semester starts. They need to know what they're walking into. And especially this fall, they need to know what they're walking into because they are as tentative and confused as you probably are right now. You need to give them information as early as possible. My semester starts in two weeks. I've got two intro level classes. I actually am today. Now that's super early, okay? And not everything's open. Not every module is open, everything else, but the syllabus is there, course instructor information, contact info, all that stuff is there so that they can start to see what they, what they need, right? And then the very first week of the semester, they start to build their community, their online community. And there's lots of different exercises that you can do to build a community. Things like have them do an introductory video that they submit to the LMS. And then have them comment on that video. Have them ask questions. I tell them about how I live at the beach and I surf. And my picture uh, on that is me, you know, surfing a wave at the Jersey Shore. And then they all ask questions. I, I walk them outside my house and show them around. Same stuff you would do in a classroom you need to do online. Okay, and probably even more so. Use your LMS, absolutely crucial. Have everything all in one space, make it nice and easy for them. Model for your students. Like I said, don't say, all right, everybody needs to do an introductory video and answer these four questions. No, say everybody needs to do an introductory video, you need to answer for these four questions. Here's mine. Let me show you how to do this. I mean, we might get into this with the questions a bit, but students don't know how to use the technology as well as you think they do, right? So model for them and be engaged. You have to be engaged, right? Constantly. My online classes, they're getting something from me every single day between Monday and Friday, even if it's just a short message. Hey, make sure that you're working on this assignment for today. That's it. Contact, contact, contact. Stay in contact, don't, don't let them feel like they're isolated. And use your campus resources. You probably all have a teaching and learning center. Um, I would say use it um, and, and find those resources that people can help, help you with.
that probably ran a little long, Kelly. My apologies. Um, but do we have questions? That was, that was great. Um, so I'm going to ask a few quick questions um, and incorporate some of the questions we've been getting already. Um, one question that uh, we can talk about real quick now, or we can wait till the end to answer, is someone asked about um, more specifics on what a learner-centered syllabus is. Um, so that's something you could uh, answer at some point. Um, and another question we got was on synchronous versus asynchronous teaching, and that uh, uh, tees up one of the questions I had for you, which is what are your thoughts on synchronous versus asynchronous teaching and how to get the most out of asynchronous activities? And the question we received from one of our participants was the fact that she's been asked to do a, sort of a blend of synchronous and asynchronous because some of her students aren't in a time zone that's anywhere, anywhere resembles the time zone she's teaching in. So uh, she's been asked to do that a little bit more. What are your thoughts on, on asynchronous synch synchronous and are there ways that she could maybe make that work for the different students she has in the time zone issue? Yeah, the time zone issue is a big one uh, that a lot of people are running into. Um, you know, even at my institution, we have several students uh, from overseas and and that makes it difficult. I think the first thing I'd say is be aware, be cognizant of that, uh, get a sense of as best you can. I know some of you are teaching much larger classes than mine. Um, I did teach at University of Delaware for several years, so I'm used to bigger classes, uh, but my classes are 20 to 30 students typically, uh, but be aware of where your students are from and figure out if synchronous will even work for you. I, I do both. Um, I will say with undergrads that your best bet at success is to try to do synchronous, even if it isn't synchronous every single day. Um, so for instance, anytime I set up a fully online class, I set up a synchronous hour in the week. Right? This is a three credit course, okay? but I, I just want one hour with them where I know that they are all online. So that if I want to do some sort of collaborative learning exercise, something along those lines, I can start it with them all in one group. And then I even let it flow into an asynchronous. I'll say, let's say we're doing a discussion board. I'll say, look, we're going to start it in a synchronous format. And then we're going to let it flow into an asynchronous. So everybody be online from one to two Eastern time you know, uh, on this day, because that's what was in the schedule and engage one another and then we'll let it flow into the next day or so in an asynchronous format. If you have students from time zones where that simply will not work and you have to go asynchronous, I think you, the biggest mistake I see with asynchronous is professors don't necessarily set timelines and they don't have a rhythm to the course. What I mean by rhythm to the course is there needs to be regularity from week to week to week on how the asynchronous course is going to run so that students know what to expect and when to expect it. So for instance, this summer I'm teaching an intro to global studies class. Monday at noon, every single week, they know that the module opens. That module opens and it contains my Panopto lecture, and any course materials that need, they need to engage, uh, videos, documentaries, readings, whatever else. Along with that is a short assignment to show that they have engaged those and that they understand that material. That assignment is due on Wednesday afternoon and immediately following that, I post another short video where I explain what we're gonna do for the rest of the week. Now I do a lot of collaborative learning exercises. So that's usually a discussion board, a Google doc, a case study, something along those lines. And I tell them, okay, so now you start this, your deadline for this is Friday evening. So now every week they know 12 o'clock this stuff opens, five o'clock on Wednesday, I got my next set of things to do. And Friday at five o'clock this all closes, I go home, I enjoy the weekend. I start again Monday morning. That's the best way, in my opinion, to run an asynchronous class. Create that rhythm to the course. Thanks, Eric. 
Um, another question that we've got from the audience that ties in with the question that I had as well was I was going to ask a question about how do you address the issue of Zoom fatigue or adapting a two and a half hour once a week course to an online setting. And we got a similar question uh, from somebody uh, that I'll read here. Um, that was, how often do you go between full class and breakout groups to problem solve on specific topics when teaching online? For example, I have a three hour senior seminar of 14 students and plan to mix it up. So talk a little bit about how you deal with the two and a half hour class. All right, so I'm not a Zoom fan. I'm gonna say that right off the bat. Uh, the, way you, the way you avoid Zoom fatigue is you don't use Zoom as much as you think you need to use it. I think you have to go back to what you're trying to accomplish within that two and a half hour time period. What are your goals for that week? Do those goals necessitate that you have them on Zoom for two and a half hours? Maybe it does, right? And then I think it is important to then create those breakout groups to have short little breaks, maybe, maybe even more than you would. Maybe in your typical two and a half hour class, you go an hour and 15 minutes, then we'll take five minutes and then we'll go another hour and 15 minutes. Maybe in a two and a half hour class, you wanna go more like 50 minutes and then take a little break. But for me, and I played with this a lot in the spring because I, I didn't use Zoom even in a lot of my online classes prior to the pandemic. Um, but because I hadn't set up my classes with the intentionality of being purely online like, like others, I felt like I needed to a little bit more. And I will tell you that if you're looking for discussion, if you're looking for collaborative exercises, if you're looking for those type of things, I got a lot more out of discussion boards, structured Google Docs, video discussion boards, all very easy things to set up than I ever got out of Zoom breakout rooms. And here's why I think that was the case. When you do a Zoom breakout room and you hit those breakout rooms, they're gone. Now, yes, you can pop in, but let's say you've got, even in a small class like mine, I would have six to eight groups. So maybe I can pop around here and there. And what happened? Nine times out of 10, I'd pop into, into a room and it was silence. And I go, what are you doing? And they're like, oh, well, you know, we kind of talked about it. I, was, I thought it was awful. And I even asked my students at the end, and they said, no, in terms of learning, we got less out of the breakout rooms than we did the discussion boards. When I do discussion boards, I can be in all of those conversations. Yes, it takes more time on my part. Right? And it's a, I even do them synchronously, and that was really harried, because then I'm like bouncing see entire conversation. Um, and I'll bring one up later because this is how I do case studies. So uh, when I talk about case studies, I'll actually show you an example of one of my Google Doc uh, collaborative learning exercises that I did for my ICC case study. Um, but, you know, short breaks, breakout rooms, if you've got to use Zoom. But I would really think long and hard about whether you think Zoom is the only way to the outcome that you're trying to achieve. Doing it for an hour here and there so that you can check in, they can see your face, they can, you can, they can see you, you can see them. That's great. It, it helps with the community to some extent. But we all know that sometimes those Zoom classes are just awkward. Um, and I think you just need to just take a step back and go, is this the only way to my outcome? If there's other ways, use it. Thanks, Eric. Um, so the, this speaks to sort of uh, my next question that has, has to do with technologies and what technologies you do use and to what extent. Um, and you mentioned that you're going to sort of show us how you use Google uh, Docs and share those throughout the class when you talk about case studies. So it might be a, a good time to sort of move on to the next section. We, we do have a lot of really good questions and important questions to get to in the end. So I want to move us on to the, to the case studies aspect of this uh, webinar and uh, you can take it from there. Thanks. Okay. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of looking at the Q&A and there are a couple of questions uh, that I'll get to. And for those of you looking for uh, some of these resources, like what exactly does a learner-centered syllabus look like? I mean, there's typically about 15 to 16 things that go into this. Uh, like I said, I think that we can probably put something together and, uh, and get it up for all of you so that you, you have these resources at your disposal. Again, if you, 
a lot of it's out there though. Like if you just, if you got on right now and Googled learner centered syllabus, there's going to be a ton of stuff that shows up. Right. And you know, we all have, you know, PhDs or we're all teaching in college or whatever. So we can discern what's a good source and a bad source. But a lot of the teaching learning centers will have this. Um, it's not rocket science, it, but it's something that most of us haven't looked at or thought about. So that's why I like to bring this up. Uh, all right. So I'm going to try to move through this kind of quickly. I'll just bring all of this up because I want to make sure that we got plenty of time for the rest of these questions that are coming up. And I want to show you the example that I have for this. So first off, um, you know, you're all on here because in some way you have an affinity for case studies and uh, ISD and they do some brilliant stuff. Uh, I published my first one with them 15 years ago and just recently published another that's, that's up. Um, I love case studies. But I will say when I first started doing blended and online, I ditched them. I really thought that I couldn't do this online the way I wanted to. And what I began to realize is I missed them. I missed what they gave to my course. I missed what they gave to my students. And so I had to figure out a way to bring them back. I believe you can run this in any one of the modalities that we talked about earlier. Again, if you focus on the learning outcomes, what is it that you're trying to achieve here? Whether it's a hybrid or an online makes a big difference. So I'll talk about the hybrid first because that's probably the easiest way to explain how I do this. And then I'll talk about the online. So remember for me, hybrid means I've got Let's say I'm doing a Tuesday, Thursday class. I've got half, I've got the, the entire class online on Tuesdays, and then I get the entire class face-to-face -face on Thursdays, right? That's my, that's my personal preferred modality. It allows me to do flipped learning and all this other stuff um, that would take way too much time to, to get into, but I love that. So now I'm gonna run a case study. Okay, think about your case study as really trying to achieve a set of outcomes. And think about those outcomes in terms of Bloom's taxonomy. The lower level end of Bloom's taxonomy is all about sort of basic, descriptive, factual knowledge. Like that's what you're trying to uh, get out of them initially. Do you understand the case? Do you understand the facts of the case? So when I would teach a case study, the first part of the class would be asking them those factual questions. Do we all understand what's going on here? So if I'm teaching my ICC case, we would ask things like, you know, what's the like-minded group and what were their interests in this? And they would work through those facts, lay the groundwork. That you can do online. Give them the case study to read and give them a set of guided questions. They can even do it individually. Right. Someone asked uh, in the, in the Q&A about the quiet students. See, this is where I love online learning. There's nowhere to hide in online learning. You have to participate. You can't sit back and let, you know, Joey who answers every question in the class just answer the question. And we all know that that's what happens. You, you try to do that Socratic method and you got those three students that always answer. And I was actually the kid who sat in the back of the room and went, I'm not going to worry about it because because Joey and Ann, they're going to answer all the questions. I can just sit back here and just chill. That's it. Now I'm in an online forum. I can't do it. I have to participate. So they've got this assignment. They're going to answer the factual questions you think are most important. Now I know they've all got a base of knowledge. They have to hand that in before they walk into class on Thursday. And I know they've got it. Now I've got an hour and 15 minutes with them on Thursday. Now I take this and I go to the next level. Now you go up in Bloom's taxonomy. Now you talk about analysis, evaluation, creation. Now we start to ask questions like, the US is vehemently opposed to the ICC. You've already told me why, because you answered in the, in the factual part of the question. What do you think that does to the US standing in terms of its soft power in relationship to the rest of the global community? And now you have that conversation. So think about the outcomes as sort of categories. What can you do online? Factual kind of stuff. And then when you get them face-to-face -face in a hybrid class, 
that's when you uh, you go into the about the analysis, evaluate, and creation part of blooms. All right. So that's the sort of the asynchronous. You don't need to do that synchronously. The initial online factual stuff, remember, understand. And then as I have on the slide, that face-to-face, -face, that's the analyze, evaluate, create. Now, what if you're doing this in a fully online class? Uh, let me show you. Let me pull this up. Um, wait, I got to exit this first. Hang on. All right, let me pull up my Chrome. Close this stuff out. All right, can we see this? Kelly, give me a thumbs up if we can see this Google Doc. Okay, so this is a, a Google Doc that I use. Um, and it's a, another way to do discussion boards. I like it better than the LMS. I think it is more organic in how uh, students engage it. And I actually think that it mimics the face-to-face -face class uh, in a way that the Canvas or Blackboard or whatever discussion boards don't necessarily do. So now this is what I would do on Thursday if I had an online class. So I want to get them at the of at the analyze, evaluate, and create, not the factual, right? They've done that assignment already. So I'll zoom in here a little on this. So I give them the instructions. Now, first thing, how do you get quiet students and others involved? Use small groups, four to six students, okay? Don't try to run any discussion board with your full class. I just don't think it works well, okay? Now, this was one that we started in a synchronous format, and then I allowed them to carry it through to the asynchronous. I wanted them to at least start it at the, at the time that they were in class, and then I carried it through. And so if you look at the prompt, I asked them two very broad questions with some subsets in between about the ICC. We were working on the ICC, and in particular, the US relation to it, and think of it as sort of imperialistic in some way. And they had my case study, but they also had some other resources to update the case, like Pompeo's assertions about the ICC in relationship to the US that he came out with earlier this year. So you can see the two questions there. They are very much analysis, evaluate type of questions. They are not factual based questions. I'm assuming that they already know what Pompeo said. As a matter of fact, I asked them that in the earlier assignment. And then I told students, and you are that color. Then we'll drop down to where the discussion happens. This is what it looks like. It looks like what they do in a classroom. And I tell them specifically, I'm like, do not delete anything. I've had asynchronous classes where someone have typed in there, I'm hungry, I'm going for pizza, I'll be back in an hour. And, I, and they're like, I shouldn't delete that? I'm like, no, I want to see everything that happens. And I am engaged in this, right? I'm orange, right? So I'm pushing them in different directions as to what they're thinking about. And they're having this conversation. And then they go to question two. And this happens a lot. Someone will find some resource and they'll paste it into the document and they start to talk about that. And then for this class, I actually had them draft a summary. And they did this for everyone. And so they would determine what these summaries would look like and who would do them. And I asked them at the end of the semester, I'm like, so how'd you guys come up with that? And they went, oh, we just split it up. Like Steven did this one and Madison did this one and Tori did this one. We knew we were gonna do a bunch. So everyone would have to take their turn to create the summary. Brilliant, self-sufficiency, problem solving. Oh my God, isn't that what we want in our students? And so they would give me a short little summary. And this is really important. This summary gets shared with the rest of the class. And then I do a short debrief video on what I saw in all the different discussions so that I'm linking them. So they're not thinking of it like, well, it's just my group here and this group here and this group here and it's three different classes. I bring all of that together. 
so that they all begin to understand, oh, they're all having these different conversations. This was what was happening here. This was what happening here. This was what was happening in this group. And if it's a purely online class, I'll switch the groups every few weeks so that they engage different people in the class. This worked really well for my case studies. Um, students enjoyed it. I think it built the skills that I was hoping it would. Um, and I've had a lot of success with this. Um, and setting up the Google Doc is, is relatively easy. It might even be embedded in your LMS. It is for us in Canvas on my university. But even if it's not, this is a technology that students can easily engage. Right? I mean, you know, there's been a couple of questions about the tech. The one thing I'd say is don't go down what I call the tech rabbit hole. Some people use tech just to use tech. Don't. Okay? Use technology that will benefit you, that will benefit your class. And don't grab 10 different things. Make your students familiar with at max three or four different things in a semester that you're going to use repeatedly. I typically use discussion boards, Google Docs, and I'm playing with VoiceThread right now, and I'm going to use that because that's more of a, a way to have an oral discussion board, and I think it's better than some of the things that are in my LMS. That's it. Then they become familiar with it, and they're not concerned about using the technology. They're concerned about learning and what's going on with the course itself, and I think that's vitally important. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. See the things that can happen. All right. Um, while I'm on this, real quick, and then we'll get into questions, just so you guys can see, uh, if you haven't been on Va Vanderbilt's um, Center for Teaching and Learning, it's brilliant. And so here is what I was talking about. There's a couple of different books on the learning-centered approach to teaching and setting up your syllabus. This 2008 second edition of O'Brien, Millis, and Cohen is one of the best, although there are others. But you can see, and again, I'll give you these resources so that we get them to you. This, this, gives, you, um, uh, this gives you some idea of what we're talking about here. You know? And I, it's a lot of the things I mentioned, you know, early contacts at the tone for the course, uh, educational purposes, um, those sort of things are, are vital uh, in your syllabus. All right, that's all I've got, Kelly, if we want to take yeah, thanks, uh, Eric. That was, yeah, that was great. Um, you've answered most of the questions that I had. And I would like to reiterate um, what Eric said as well. We will be getting out a lot of uh, resources to you all over the course of the next week or so. Uh, anybody that was signed up or, or participated today will get a lot of this stuff to you. Um, I know there's a lot coming at you kind of fast and furious here. Um, and some of this can be, if you're teaching online for the first time, um, a lot of this can be new type, new language. Um, so we'll make sure to get a lot of that stuff to you as we move along. Um, so, uh, Eric, I don't know if you wanna look over some of the questions we've got here. Um, and, and please feel free, we've got about five minutes left, folks, um, if you want to uh, shoot off some uh, questions here in the Q&A function here in the, in the webinar. So, um, Pablo asked about Google Doc comments. Um, I, I did not use the Google Doc comments for this particular exercise because I didn't think it was necessary in that they were basically having a conversation and all just creating this Google Doc in a collaborative exercise. Um, so for, for those purposes, I didn't find it necessary. And I didn't want my comments to be an aside. I wanted to be part of the conversation. So I could see using Google Docs if you wanted to be, if you run your collaborative learning and your group discussion exercises as you more of a bit of an outsider than an insider, then I think that would be great. But I like to be part of it. So I pick a color, I'm in this, um, and I show them that I'm engaged. And I found that uh, that, that works really, really well. Um, Oral presentations in your online classes uh, by more than one student. I have done oral pr presentations. Um, more than one student, 
I did do this once and I had them collaborate on it, but I also allowed them to problem solve how they wanted to do it. And I will say that the bulk of the groups decided that one person was gonna do the presentation and I had them at the end provide a short description of how they went about engaging this exercise and determining how they would fulfill that exercise. And they all explained that they felt that there was one person that spoke really well. They wanted to them to do the oral presentation anyway, and others um, provided the support in terms of resources and things like that for that person to create that, um, that online oral presentation. Personally, I'm fine with that because I do enough other oral participation exercises for individuals that I don't feel like they're not engaging and working on their oral communication skills. Um, for me, that, that exercise was, in terms of my outcomes, was as much about problem solving to figure out how to do this than it was about the actual oral presentation. So again, and I've said this several times today, you really need to go back to your outcomes. When, when you have students do an oral presentation, what is it that you are trying to accomplish? Because what you want out of that versus what I want out of that may be different. Okay? So I think it's very important that you, you think about it that way. Eric, uh, just like to follow up on one question. You, you uh, spoke a little bit to the idea of how to bring in sort of the shy kids and make sure they're talking by using the Google Docs and other, other types of activities. Um, how do you try to be more sensitive to diversity in an online setting? And then uh, another quick question that we actually got in the chat um, deals with the case studies and whether or not you feel that you can do, uh, still have success with case studies in a purely asynchronous version. Okay. Um, in terms of the diversity issue, I will say I, personally have not run into many issues. I feel like I set up a, a, a very open environment. Um, I, I guess I haven't engaged this enough and probably should because I haven't run into any issues. And again, I'm at a very small institution where if there are issues like diversity issues, it's a rarity that it does not get back <laughs> to you. Um, I will say that Thinking about diversity in terms of uh, universal design and things like that, I did run into an issue with a student uh, with learning disabilities last semester when I did a synchronous discussion board. About this again, because I, I don't know, I guess I think my students trust me and she told me afterwards, she goes, that was really hard for me. And I went, I, I don't understand. What do you mean it was really hard for you? She said she had a very difficult time typing quickly, so she couldn't keep up with the synchronous discussion board. And I just thought, oh, stupid, why didn't I think of that? Um, so I think one of the things you have to do in terms of, of diversity and all of these things is, again, I'll throw out another term here. If you haven't engaged the universal design literature and incorporated that into both the creation of your syllabus and what you're doing within your your LMS, um, you really should make sure that this is, you know, this is in terms of accessibility issues and, and those sort of things. Um, again, I, I think that everybody is talking about diversity and exactly what to do. I think that that's getting out of my personal professional comfort zone to give advice on this. Um, and I think it's important that we all know where our lane is. And so I would love to go on a webinar like this and listen to someone talk to me a bit more about that. So I'm dodging the question a bit, but I think it's because of, um, that's not literature that I've engaged. Uh, Kirsten Hammond, who I did a workshop with last week, she's got all this stuff down and she actually did that portion for us last week. Um, revitalized your career or your interest enjoyment of it? Uh, I'd say both. I'd say both. Um, I think my teaching had gotten stale and I really wanted to just do more um, in terms of my pedagogy. And when I, I I'll, I'll say this 
straight up front. I did this because I moved to New Jersey and I teach in Virginia. And then I realized how much I loved it. Um, and I, I just, I find so many benefits to it. But again, that is a personal choice. Maybe you guys have to do this in fall and you do it better than you did in spring. And that's really what you're looking for. And once maybe we get back to more normalcy with face-to-face -face classes, you go, that was great, but it's not really for me. And that's fine because it's not. You, you do have to enjoy this to do it well, I think, just like anything else. Um, I think Plato was right in that, in that regard all those years ago, right? Um, bandwidth challenges. As someone described it to me recently, the old excuse used to be a dog ate my homework. Now, now the, uh, the excuse is that uh, my internet cut out. I think you have to deal with it in a very similar manner. Um, so that's just something that you have to work through. And again, make it very transparent in your syllabus and in your initial introductions to the course, how you're gonna handle those issues. So Pamela asked about structuring seminars rather than big classes. Uh, so I assume more of those small discussion oriented classes. I think if you I think those are the moments where if your students are more comfortable with Zoom, if you've got 10 to 12 students in a seminar style upper level class, my 300, 400 level classes tend to work that way. You, you can do more Zoom, but again, be aware, be aware of Zoom fatigue. I would mix it with things like the Google discussion board or a Canvas discussion board or something along those lines. And to Doroth, uh, yes, I absolutely tell them that they have to show their faces in Zoom. That is a requirement for all of my classes, unless they can tell me that they have some sort of bandwidth issues. If they are going to be face-to-face -face in a Zoom setting, then they are going to be face-to-face. -face. And I think that's really important to set that right, right from the start. Tabletop exercises and small group negotiations. Uh, I, you have to reconfigure your tabletop exercises and figure out ways to do those type of exercises in a different format. Um, I, I have used several of those in the, in the past, you know, Tragedy of the Commons is a classic. I've run Prisoner's Dilemma. You have to reconfigure them based on the outcome that you're hoping to achieve. And this is a drawback. Sometimes they just don't work in the online setting. Small new group negotiations, I think, can work. And that's where I personally would use a Google Doc. I think that the Google Docs provide the most organic, I guess, instrument for getting that dialogue back and forth. Now, I'm also playing with something called VoiceThread. And VoiceThread, I think, is going to give me something even better than that that they can do in an oral discussion. I've played with it a bit. This will be the first semester that I'm using it fully in my classes, but you might want to check out VoiceThread uh, as a possibility for those small group negotiations. The chat disabled during the presentation. I think it depends on your class, Piper. I like having all of those things on when I run Zoom, but I also have a very small class. Um, I also really like polls. I use polls a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. And I think that they are absolutely fantastic for just sparking student interest and getting them to consider that and then move on. So I use them almost like entrance tickets. If you guys are familiar with using entrance tickets in your classes, they walk in, there's a question on the board. You got five minutes, answer it. Sometimes I'll use polls that way. Sometimes I'll even use an entrance question when they first come in and I'll say, look, in Canvas, there's an entrance question, answer that real quick. I look it over and then that sets them up for the discussion. That gets them talking a little more freely in Zoom, just like it does in the class. 
All right. Thanks, Eric. Um, I think that takes us to a little over the two o'clock hour at this point. So um, I'd like to go ahead and wrap things up today. Uh, I'd like to remind everyone to go to isd.georgetown.edu to check out ISD's case studies library. And I know Alistair in the chat function has, has, has pushed out a lot of information to you guys on that and other things we've mentioned here. And I, I, once again, I'd like to say that we will push out a number of resources to everyone in the uh, coming days and uh, we'll put together a package of stuff to send everyone and also have um, more teaching resources up on our website and the case studies page on our website as well. And last but not least, I'd like to thank Eric again for providing his time and his insights today. I know it's gonna be useful for me and for uh, hopefully everyone as we uh, face uh, this uh, upcoming semester, uh, which is gonna be kicking off extremely soon. and. Um, lastly, just good luck to everybody uh, this semester and beyond and uh, making the best of this and, and uh, learning some new skills in the, in the process. So thanks for, to everybody for joining us today and thanks, Eric, for providing your time and insights.